Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Rick Jeffrey, welcome to the Center of the Universe. Oh, Paul, thank you. It's great to be here. And, uh, you know, we met recently and you asked me to do this and it's a great honor. So thank you very much for having me. I think thanks for saying that, Rick. Uh, you're you're brushing past how we met. <laughs> was, well, was, well, you can you can bring that up. I'm, I'm not going to bring that up, but you're welcome to do that. Has it been what two weeks, three weeks? And it's about three weeks, I think. Yeah, three weeks. Uh, yeah, you, you uh, were bestowed an honor that uh, very few people get to uh, Virginia Sports Hall of Fame uh, because of all the uh, work you've done with Special Olympics. But you were an athlete as well as a, as a younger person. But we'll, we'll get into all those or some of those details. Uh, you are a Richmond guy through and through, though, right? You've you were- uh, Absolutely. I've lived here all my life. I went to uh, Ham Sydney, played basketball there. I was there for four years. But other than that, I've lived in Richmond my entire life. So, so literally just college and then the rest of the time's in Richmond. Oh, yeah. Yep. I grew up in the West End. I went to Freeman, uh, played basketball, played a lot of sports there uh, at, at Tuckahoe and Freeman, you know, grew up playing sports like every like every kid in the 60s did in the West End, grew up playing sports in Tuckahoe Little League um, and, you know, forced a lot of friendships that I still have there and uh, and and just, you know, went to Tuckahoe, went to Freeman um, and. You know, some of the coaches uh, at Freeman had gone to Randolph Macon. Some of the coaches at Freeman had gone to Ham Sydney. Not that had that had had a lot to do with it. I was recruited by three places really: um, Roanoke College, uh, Ham Sydney, and Randolph Macon. And um, and I knew those folks well. They were very nice. Charlie Moore was a coach at at, at uh, Roanoke. Uh, they actually went on win a national championship. I think my freshman year. Um, and uh, Paul Webb was a coach at. Um, at Randolph Macon. And then uh, uh, Bill uh, Pegram was a coach at Ham Sydney. And then after he recruited me, he actually left and went and was an assistant for Chuck No at VCU. Oh, um, wow. And Homer Gar came in there. Homer Gar had been at Manchester High School in the early 60s, had won state title a couple of times there with some great players, uh, a guy named Bob Bundy who played at Vanderbilt, a guy named Joe Green who was signed at the University of Richmond and was tragically killed on a car accident on Riverside Drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and they were great. And, and Homer came there. He came, he actually had been a college assistant at two places. The last one was Oral Roberts university in Utah and, um, just didn't like the division one experience came back and was a division three coach and, uh, and, and was a great, a great person. And, uh, I remember that on the recruiting, uh, process that, uh, my father really wanted me to go to Randolph Macon and, and, uh, and I, Eddie Webb, who was actually the first executive director of Virginia Sports Hall of Fame um, when they opened, I had played against Eddie at every level, uh, and I knew Eddie well. We were friends, and um, you know, Paul came and sat in my living room, and my dad really liked him because they had a, a, a friend that they shared in common. And I think he really wanted me to go to Randolph Macon, which is, I'm sure, probably why I went to Hampton City because you never do what your dad wants you to do when you're like 17, right? Yeah. And um, but I went to Ham City. It was fun. And and like I said, I had some coaches at Freeman. Uh, my basketball coach, Jim Sangston, who later became the AD at Freeman, was the AD at Freeman probably for over 30 years and was probably, I think he's in the Virginia High School Hall of Fame. He was probably one of the best athletic directors in, in, in the Virginia high school history. Um, and he was there actually on Saturday morning at the Hall of Fame induction when you were there. Oh, wow, and yeah, it was great. And uh, that was it was nice to see him. And um, and he had gone to Randolph Macon and then uh, the assistant coach, Wayne Hoy, had gone to Randolph Macon and Wayne's brother, Tommy, was actually playing it. I mean, had gone to Ham Sydney and Tommy was Tommy Hoy was actually playing in Ham Sydney at the time. And we when we went to Ham Sydney, we actually had a little bit more of an interactive experience because, um, you know, we knew some of the players there and they kind of took us up there and, and, and uh, you know, showed us around for a week. And, and, and it was, Ham City is a beautiful place and I had a great time and still have a lot of great memories and great friends from there. But other than that, yeah, I, I was in, I've, I've been in Richmond. I came back um, and uh, I coached at Amelia Academy for three years. I was the head varsity basketball coach mm-hmm. there. I, I was so unprepared, uh, Paul. I was like 20, I guess I was 24 uh, and I was, you know, I mean, I played all my life and I actually did a pretty good job. We actually went to state Academy finals the first year I was there. We had some, we had some really good players um, the first couple of years. And, 
And, um, and I was there three years. And you know what that actually allowed me to do in those in the old days, Ham Sydney didn't have any education program and I wanted to teach and coach. Mm. And that in order to get what was called the collegiate professional certificate at the time, um, I coached at a MU Academy for three years. And if you coached at an accredited private school for three years, the state would issue you a collegiate professional certificate, which could allow you to teach, uh, teach in the public schools. Um, and, and at that time I, uh, taught in Henrico County schools for about six more years and, uh, also refereed high school and then moved into college basketball and then got an opportunity to work at, um, at Special Olympics, um, probably when I was about 32, I think, and I was there for 36 years. So tell a story of how you connected with Special Olympics. Yeah, you asked me that in the parking lot, and I was getting ready to tell you that, and and you said, oh, you know, hold that for the podcast. <laughs> um, it's actually interesting. Uh, it, it, I thought it, I always think back on this and think it was very providential. I was refereeing a ball game in Roanoke, uh, Roanoke Civic Center. I don't even remember who was playing. Probably Virginia Tech, maybe. Um, and 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 so working the game, and this is back in the uh, '80s, and um, that was when they they would have the women's game at six and the men's game at eight. Okay, and so we're in the locker room before the men's game, uh, you know, doing our kind of a pregame conference and stuff, and we're we're in there for a few minutes, and the guy, the two guys uh, working the girl, a women's game came in and uh, sat down, and we were talking to them, and I did. The, one of the guys said, "I'm from Richmond." And his name was Pete Lampman, super guy. And um, I said, well, I don't really know you. I'm from Richmond and I know everybody in Richmond at referees and I don't really know you. So, well, I just moved there from Lynchburg because I'm the assistant executive director of Special Olympics Virginia. And um, I said, and, and, I, and I made to him what I always tell you, it was a flip remark that you make to people. I said, wow, that's a great organization. Got any openings? It, and it was really kind of, it was a very casual remark and he actually took a card out of his out of his uh, referee bag and he threw it over and it landed in my bag. And we chatted for a couple minutes. And, and that was pretty much it. We went out, refereed the game, came home, never really thought about it. Um, and about a week later, I'm fishing through my bag and I pull out this card and it's Pete Lampman's card. And I'm thinking about it, thinking, wow, that's that's interesting. Uh, it, it's a it's a it's a pretty cool use of sports with people with intellectual disabilities to build a more inclusive world. It, it wasn't really articulated in that way at that particular time back in the 80s. Um, th those kind of are, are, are a little bit more modern articulation of that. But um, I called him up February, met with him in March, went out to a couple of events in the spring, to the summer games at the University of Richmond, which was like the, maybe the first or second year they'd been at the University of Richmond. They'd been there about 40 years now, and uh, the summer games. And it was just a very cool environment, very nice. And, and I decided... You know, if I don't do this now, I will be the principal at, you know, somewhere in Echo County. And that would be fine. I loved education. I loved the kids. It was, I love my time in education. Um, but I, I, I've never regretted uh, making that move. And I thought if I never make it, I, if I never make it now, I won't make it. And, and I made the move to Special Olympics and I was there 36 years and 22 as president and CEO. And I always think back to that night that I refereed that game in, in Roanoke, Paul, is that if, if something happens, if it snows two feet and the ball game is postponed, even a day, and the crews, the referee crews change, because that's really what happens, because, you know, you're refereeing somewhere else the next night, and the crews change. I don't referee that game. I don't meet Pete Lampman, and I don't, I'm not at Special Olympics. And so I always think there was a little bit of providence at play in there. And as I spoke, as I did many times over the years to all kinds of groups, but especially to a lot of young people in high schools and in college programs, I would always tell them, be awake, okay? Because most of what happens in your life uh, really happens because of timing. And, and, and you just kind of got to be awake and see what opportunities present themselves because if you don't take advantage of them or if you're not awake and you miss them, it may never come your way again. And, it, and that's just, you know, I never look back and it, it, it was a great ride. I mean, you know, went all over the world and it was a very cool, very cool time. Uh, did you have any experiences with Special Olympics before? I did not. Encounter? I did not. I knew what Special Olympics, well, I knew, I knew kind of a layman's terms what Special Olympics is. Most people right now, if you ask most people, they would probably tell you 
uh, sports, intellectual disabled people, but they couldn't necessarily tell you all the things that we do. And and I think over the years, um, we we listen. We we have we have probably the greatest staff in the country of any special ed program. There are programs that are bigger. I mean, we're not Pennsylvania, we're not Texas, we're not California, we're not New York, we're not Florida. They're the five probably five biggest programs, maybe Illinois. Um, but we have we have we have as, as as we have the best group in the country. A, a bunch of veteran people. I mean, people that work there with me. I'll work with these folks. Some of these folks are senior leadership people there. Um, a couple, you know, anywhere from 10 to uh, 30 years. And that's unheard of in a nonprofit business. Nonprofit business a lot of time is a revolving door, okay? Because people, either they want to move to somewhere else because the staffs are small, the leadership opportunities are not always imminent. Um, and, and you know, you, 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 if you stick it out and you get into the leadership positions, you'll get, you'll, you'll get well paid and make a good living. But you have to be patient enough to get there. And um, and I tell that's another thing I tell young people, be patient, find something you really like to do and love to do, because if you do, you'll never work a day in your life. But you got to be patient. And young people today are very impatient. They wanted something right now and they um, they want to make more money. And so a lot of times they move. But we had um, a veteran group of senior leaders that had, you know, well, you know, well over 150 years of, of experience in Special Olympics and a nonprofit. So we were a little bit of an anomaly. And some of our people, I mean, you know, Roy Zodman, Senior VP uh, at, at for Development, uh, developed the whole law enforcement fundraising idea, which was Torch Run and, and the Polar Plunge. We'll talk about that. Um, Holly Clater, uh, communications person, best communications person in Special Olympics in the country, including everybody at the international office. Holly is a writer, a messenger, and is just probably one of the best liked people in, in the state of Virginia. Um, and, and the media contacts that she's been able to develop over the years has been extraordinary. And then the guy that took my place, my successor, David Thomason, was there with me for uh, 30 years. And he spent the last 10 to 12 years as the uh, vice president for advancement, which is a fancy word that really colleges use uh, for individual giving, major gifts, leadership giving. Um, and we were one of probably four or five countries, uh, programs in the country that actually were doing uh, individual giving and major gifts with larger donors. And um, I'm really glad we did because it really, we met a lot of people. We got a lot of really nice gifts, endowment built up. And um, we did a lot of things a lot of other programs didn't do. And, and part of that was because we had a really, really super smart board of directors who came in every day, and I said this in my induction speech, our board of directors came in every day and, and didn't sit around thinking of things for us to do. They came, came in every day and said, how can we help you? And that's a, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, in, a, in the for-profit or non-profit world, when your board is not in the weeds, but they're up here trying to figure out ways that they can help you and move you forward. And I mean, we had senior leadership people from Geico and Booz Allen and Truist and Virginia Farm Bureau and Tuckahoe Orthopedics and, you know, just large, I mean, some really top law enforcement leadership people. Um, and it was really, I mean, our board of directors was, was really an extraordinary group and they raised a ton of money and help us connect within the community. And, and that's really kind of really what we did. People ask me all the time, what did you, what did you do as the president and CEO? I come back, connected dots. Yeah. I, I gave like, I connected dots and, and connected them up to, to people and organizations and corporations uh, that could help us. And you enjoy connecting those dots and seeing the fruits of those dots being connected, I imagine. Well, that's how you meet so many people who later on, some of them became people on our staff. I mean, one guy, Dave Pulowski, who was the vice president for sports and programs. I don't think I mentioned Dave when I was talking about all the others, but he's the best sports and, and he's the best sports and health guy in the country. And he worked for Tuckahoe Orthopedics. He was the head athletic trainer. He's a certified athletic trainer. He was the head athletic trainer at Tucker Orthopedics. And that was back in the day when they had Dick Kasperi and Rick Myers and the people who really were, were groundbreaking people in this country in sports medicine, specifically in arthroscopic surgery. 
and and they had their they had a full sports medicine program there, and Dave worked there. And Tucker Orthopedics, those docs, they came out and covered our uh, events. They came out and covered the summer games. They covered the ski event at Wintergreen, and they were super, and they loved it. And that's how we met Dave Pulowski. Um, and uh, when I took over, I went and recruited him and said. I need somebody who can really do sports and program and who can help develop the health initiatives because he's really a sports uh, medicine professional by trade. And we develop, we push the sports even further forward and develop some great health initiatives, which I'll talk about as we go through the podcast. All right. So uh, I'm a parent who magically has a kid in the 80s, and I also have a kid your last few years uh, as as a CEO, what can I expect as a parent for my child with an intellectual disability uh, in the eighties? And what can I expect? uh, What could I expect at your last few years? Well, I will tell you this uh, on the whole, um, the more things change, Paul, the more things stay the same sometimes, you know? And so I'll start first of all with rejection because people with intellectual disabilities are, are, have been at the bottom of the barrel forever. I mean, forever. I mean, they're still institutionalized in a lot of countries around the world. OK. Um, and really, the state of Virginia did a great thing probably about 10 to 12 years ago. And again, it could have been a little longer, give or take either way, when they went and deinstitutionalized and went to community based housing for people with intellectual disabilities. It was a big stressor for a lot of parents. I had a parent that lived two doors down that had a daughter um, uh, who was an adult and she was in the Northern Virginia training center and had lived there comfortably for 20 years. And now she's going to have to move into a group home and, and, and community-based housing. And, you know, I, I, I talked to them a ton because they were neighbors. I saw them all the time. And, um, they, they moved her into found her a really nice group home setting in the West end of Richmond. She's still there. They've passed, uh, the father has passed on. Mom is still alive, but the daughter lives over in the West End group home. And mom, who was really the one who was stressed out about it, told me after she'd been in the home for a couple of years, the best thing that ever happened to her. So really, a lot of things have happened that are good. OK, there are more opportunities, not just with Special Olympics and sports. A lot of other sports opportunities, top soccer Soccer uh, groups like Strikers and, and those things have opened up top soccer programs. Little Leagues have opened up things like Challenger Baseball. So from a sports standpoint, there's there's more things going on. Um, uh, recreational programs and, and things like the, um, the Spark program here in town, which is the Performing Arts Group, has mm-hmm. an intellectual disabled program that does a show down at the Altria. Many of those athletes, many of those performers in that program are special Olympic athletes. And it's very cool because it's an inclusive program. So you've got performers singing and dancing and playing music um, that are both intellectual disabled and disabled and not uh, and non-disabled. Um, and so that's very cool. So there's a lot more opportunity now, but still the schools are coming, the schools are getting better. Okay. And some schools do it better than others. Um, the workplace still, you know, it, it's a struggle to find a good job when you can stay at it for a long time. Um, there are some great places that hire. Listen, we one of the great sponsors that we have is is um, a group called Body Knoll Enterprises. They're a group out of Rocky Mount, North Carolina, but they own every Hardee's restaurant in the state of Virginia. It's 180 plus. OK, mm. and they employ have employed over the years a ton of special Olympic athletes in their restaurants, uh, in the food service industry. Uh, grocery stores, you know, Ucrops was always really good at this. Kroger is really good at this. Publix, um, which has come on now. Um, and they provide a, a good work right, place for people with intellectual disabilities also. But, you know, then we're talking food service and we're talking um, uh, grocery, front-end portering, and then we're talking maybe... Um, maintenance in in schools or food services in schools. Um, And a lot of our athletes, listen, we have athletes who have been, who graduated from four-year colleges with, with, with the, with the inclusion now of autistic people into our program, not that they weren't included before. We have always had people with autism in our program, but in the last 20 years, the number of people identified with autism, Paul was like 400% of what it used to be. It's incredible, you know? Um, And it's, 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 um, and, and, you know, they can be at any place on the spectrum 
I mean, you know, we we have there's a a state senator here in town who uh, who, who has a daughter who is in, uh, who's autistic at the top end of the spectrum, graduated from the University of Virginia, works for Microsoft. So, you know, you you can be at that end of the spectrum and you can be at the end of the spectrum where you're severely autistic and it's a struggle for you to do anything much. So I would say to answer your question, things are better than they were in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, and things continue to get better. There are more opportunities available um, for extracurricular activities. There are more opportunities available in the workplace, but it's it's you know it, and it's also county to county. I don't I don't I'm not as familiar right now with and you live in Hanover, I believe is that right? Yeah, um, all the counties in Central Virginia are really pretty good. Have pretty good uh, social services programs. Um, and but where I live in Chesterfield, I live in Chesterfield. Chesterfield's got a really great. Um, social services program, and they identify these athletes and they give them job coaches. They will transport them to work. They will transport them home after work. They will transport them to extracurricular activities like Special Olympics, or we've got a great relationship with the Knights of Columbus, which is a men's Catholic service organization. We have a ton of Special Olympic athletes that belong to Knights of Columbus. They'll transport them to a meeting like that. Um, They give them job coaches. I saw some of them at Kroger today. OK, that were up there shopping because they got a life coach that takes them in there and they shop and the life coach just kind of, uh, you know, shepherds them along and kind of watches them and make sure that they're helping them take care of themselves. And all the counties and cities have this, but obviously some are better than others. Um, and that's you know, those things are not really what we did, but we got to know some of those people in some of those programs because, you know, our athletes are in those programs. Um, so. I think the future is much brighter for a person with an intellectual disability, disability. But I always say, Paul, that the Special Olympic parents are the real heroes of Special Olympics because their job is 24-7, 365. They are caregivers. They are chief cook and bottle washer. They are bus drivers, run taxi service. And it may never end. And you were telling me earlier you got one that came home from college and he's getting on a plane tomorrow, fly to London, see your other one who's in uh, doing an educational program in England. Yeah. And um, that's a, a, a pro uh, that's an opportunity. I'm sure some of our athletes would love to have, but that would be a difficult thing for them uh, to travel independently in that mode. Although some could very easily do it. And I have traveled with them. I've traveled all over the world with our guys. Um, and again, special Olympics is, is people at all different levels of ability. Some who, struggle to walk 10 meters with an assisted device like a like a walker. Um, and some, like uh, the story I told in my induction speech at the Hall of Fame, a um, young lady named Karen Dickerson, who has run the Boston Marathon twice in under three and a half, which puts you in the top 7% of all women in the Boston Marathon. So we've got athletes that can, that are world beaters, and we got athletes that are the best at what they do at their level of ability. If you, if you, if you think in terms, and when, when we get all these athletes together, you know, lower ability ones, higher ability ones, you get them all together. They all, they all one group, they all one family, they all one community. We travel together. Um, the, the stronger athletes, the, uh, the, the higher uh, functioning skilled athletes will take care of the younger ones. We had, a, we went to the, well, the first, first world games I ever went to is Minneapolis in 1991. It was housed at, the U in Minneapolis, which is the University of Minnesota. Very cool place. Minneapolis, a very cool uh, city. And um, we had athletes that were at all levels of ability on, on that team. And we had an athlete named Woody Vereen, who was, who was really a very good athlete from Newport News, but he's a wheelchair athlete, okay? And he, he had CP, he's in a wheelchair. And when the uh, the we were staying in a dorm uh, at St. Thomas University, which was not too far from the University of Minnesota campus, and the dorm didn't have any. This was not. See, this is the other thing you ask about: what's available for your child? These places were not handicap accessed at all, you know. And so there were no elevators in these dorms, and our guys were standing on the third floor, mm. you know. And the 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 people at um, housing said, well, you know, we've got a couple of dorm rooms over here on the first floor where we can put your wheelchair guy and our wheelchair athletes. There were, there were, I guess there's probably six of them. The other five wheelchair athletes said, no, 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 no. 
Woody stays with us. And every day they would pick up Woody out of the wheelchair, one of them would put him over his shoulders like you would do with your kids when they were little, calling him sack of potatoes. But they'd put him over their shoulder like a sack of potatoes and they'd walk him up three three levels of stairs. Another one would close the wheelchair up and take him up and Woody stays with us. I'll never forget them saying that. And that came from our athletes. That didn't come from us. You know, we would have probably said, okay, well, that's a nice accommodation to put him over here on the first floor. But our athletes said, no way. Will you staying with us? And that, that's 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 the kind of stuff they take care of each other. It's a it's a community um, of people. Yeah, and that that energy, that vibe, that love, uh, is what kept you there for thirty six years. It sounds like. Well, you know, you 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 get involved with it. You ask me if I've ever done anything with Special Olympics before. I haven't. So I go into this, and I don't know anything about Special Olympics, Paul. Okay. And you know that you know the you know, the old the old uh, the thing that you learn very quickly on the baseball field as a seven year old kid heads up, you know <laughs> you know you, you can get smacked with a baseball. Um, you got to be heads up and you got to be awake because stuff happens, like the Woody Vereen story I just told, where it's great that Woody stayed with the group, but the story is larger than that. It's people taking care of people, okay, and it's people wanting everybody to be included, see, because they've been excluded for so long. They don't want to see one of their guys excluded off of their group, you know, because they knew standing on that third floor in that dorm, they're going to have a ton of fun. They're going to be there for a week. They're going to have a lot of fun. And Woody's going to miss that. And they didn't, they didn't want, they wanted him to be included. So, you know, I learned so much. I mean, you know, I thought, I thought when I went into a special book, sort of a really nice thing, Paul. And, it, and, it, and, it, and after a few years, because it takes you a while to absorb all this stuff. I learned that it's, it, it is a nice thing, but it's important. It's important, Paul, because if people, I would have, I would, and this is the kind of education that we did with donors and sponsors. I had a donor say to me one time up in Northern Virginia, hey, you know, I, we do stuff with y'all and we do stuff with Children's Hospital. Now I get Children's Hospital. We're saving kids' lives. But with you, or oh, we're putting a basketball in the hands of a person with an intellectual disability. How does that equate to saving a kid's life at the at the uh, at the children's hospital? And I said, "Look, I'm so sorry because we have done a poor job of letting you know what it is that we do." Okay, you've got sickness in the world, you have hunger in the world, you have discrimination in the world, you have all kind war, you have all kinds of problems that are going on in this world, and most of them occur, Paul. Because people cannot overcome their differences and no longer fear their neighbor. Okay. It's going on in the Middle East right now. Okay. Yep. And that's what we do at Special Olympics. We, because fundamentally, most people are afraid of our athletes. Okay. They're afraid of them. They're afraid of them for a couple of reasons. They're different. That's probably number one. And the other is they, 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 they could, they're afraid that their child could, be disabled or there, but, but, but there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know? And, and so fear becomes a big, very thing. So we teach people to include people and bring people together, individual differences, whether they are disabilities, which is what we're looking at. Um, but they could also be gender. They could also be race. They could also be socioeconomic. They could also be religious. They could also be anything that makes you different is a tool to divide. And we use that thing that makes our athletes different, the intellectual disability, to bring people together. So I told that guy that told me that that day, I said, look, we are attacking the number one problem that exists in the world today, okay? People's inability to overcome their differences and no longer fear their neighbor and love their neighbor and live together. Because if we did that, we could solve the hunger. We could solve the uh, health problems. We could stop the wars. We could do all the things that we're not doing because we're afraid of each other and we don't want to include each other. And this is a this is again. I don't want to get I don't want to get all I don't want to get all up in the atmosphere here. Um, but Special Olympics became very mission oriented to me, Paul. And and we wanted people to understand that we wanted to use sports to create a more inclusive world. And after we created a more inclusive world and gave you that experience, because Special Olympics is not an event. 
It's an experience, okay? And if we give you that experience and you absorb that experience, then you can extrapolate that experience out to being more inclusive of, of, of race, of gender, uh, of religion, of anything that makes us different. And, and that's, that's, that's our story. But I'm telling you, if, if people are listening to your podcast thinking, what is he talking about? You know, Special Olympics, that's a you know, track and field meet. No, it's a lot more than that. It's about people, thousands of athletes struggling every day to be included meaningfully in the world. That's why when Will Driscoll called me and said, you know, me in the Hall of Fame, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's it's a little overwhelming, Will. And it's very humbling because Special Olympics is not about me. OK, it's about thousands of athletes and their family members struggling every day to be included meaningfully in the workplace, in the neighborhood, in the community, in the school. Classmate, neighbor, coworker, friend. That's it. That's what our athletes would like to be. And we have to be a good community in that in that uh, a good community neighbor there, because the primary community that most of our athletes spend their time in is their family. OK. But once they step out of that family, we're like your biggest and strongest community that they got. And we need to be good. And we need to not only be providing the programming for them to make them, you know, healthier and fitter uh, with a chance to get better and win on and off the playing field. But at the same time, we have to change your mind about the value of someone who's different than you. And Special Olympics may be more important for the people, maybe more important for the general public than it is for our athletes, because if we can change the minds, you'll view those folks differently and you'll be more likely to uh, include them in the workplace. You'll be more not likely not to freak out if an autistic kid is sitting next to your child in school. You'd be more likely not to freak out if a group home is in your mother's neighborhood. I mean, these are, I'm just telling you all the things that we experience and see all the time. Yeah. Um, and so just trying to build that world more inclusive and in our vehicle is sports. Uh, you mentioned the young lady from uh, that competed in the Boston Marathon a couple of times. And you told that during your speech, as you mentioned at the Hall of Fame ceremony, uh, Rick, I have to tell you, it, it stuck with me more than any of the other speeches, that particular story. Uh, do you mind? I, I know they recorded it. It's out there. You can you can check it out probably in the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, but I would love it if you could tell a version of what you told during your speech. Yeah, I think if you actually if you go on the Hall of Fame website, I think all that stuff is on there. And I think they actually have the speeches in some cases condensed a little bit down. Uh, and, and I know that that version of the story is there because that was kind of the centerpiece of my remarks. But we have a, a woman that lives in Northern Virginia, and I could say, well, she's an adult. Um, she's, uh, I will call her a young adult. She's younger than us. Um, and um, when she was in elementary school, she would go out and this, uh, you know, PE class didn't work for Karen. Her name is Karen Dickerson. Um, PE class didn't work for Karen. Um, you know, whistles blowing, balls going off. I mean, Karen is intellectually disabled, uh, kind of an introvert, and 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 largely nonverbal. Now she's not, she can speak, but she's largely nonverbal. Okay. Um, in fact, most people think she is nonverbal, but she, she can communicate and, but she just doesn't communicate a lot. Um, so they would take her and put her out on the track and let her walk around the track. Um, and then they looked at there one day and she's running around the track, you know, and they're like, Oh, he cares running around the track. That's pretty good. So they encouraged her as she got into middle school to, to run on the track team. She loved to run on the track team. She loved to run distances. She, she was a middle distance and then a distance runner. Um, and then she ran distances, you know, uh, middle distance. But, you know, all the high school the, the distances are really middle distance, 1,500 and 3,000. They're really middle distances. But that's what she, what she ran in high school at Edison High School in Springfield. And then as she got out of high school and she got older, she decided she wanted to run in a marathon. So she, they, she, she ran, she, she kind of got herself geared into the, the Marine Corps marathon, which is in DC. Okay. It's in November. And uh, it's a, it's a pretty easy marathon because it runs through the district and it's flat. Okay. 
And it's a good starter marathon for people who haven't done it before. And she ran the 10K and then she ran the half marathon and then she ran the marathon and she was like, just no problem. You know, ran the marathon. And then she comes home and she says to her folks, you know what I want to do? I want to, I want to run a marathon in every state in the country. Now, if you're a parent and your child comes home and says that, you may think, have you lost your mind? You know, um, but they were retired federal workers and they had means and they had time. And they thought there's something we can do together. And they embarked on that. I mean, she's ran here at the Richmond Marathon right after she ran at the World Games in China in 2007. Um, and she um, has run a marathon in, in a ton of states. I, I can't keep up with it. And um, she's been all over the country running these marathons. But her mother calls me up one day and says, I want to tell you that Bo Karen has qualified for Boston because you can't just enter the Boston Marathon. You have to qualify for the Boston Marathon at a qualifying uh, marathon site. And I don't remember which site she ran. She qualified, but she qualified for Boston. So they entered Boston. They're going to Boston to run. And I talked to her mom uh, that morning and she says, uh, I'll call you um, and let you know how she did. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of, you know, sitting on pins and needles all day thinking I'm, you know, getting, you know, we hope, we hope she can do this. It's the big time. It's the Boston marathon, you know? Um, and so about, I don't know, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, her mom, Ernestine, Ernie is what she goes by. Ernie, Ernie Dickerson calls me and says, I'm just letting you know, Karen finished the Boston Marathon. She ran it in 326, which put her in the top 7% of everyone, of all women in the marathon. Not Special Olympic women, not women with disabilities, all women in the Boston Marathon, she's in the top 7%, okay? And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. 326, we got an athlete that ran under three and a half into Boston. But that's a kind of, three and a half is kind of a benchmark into Boston, especially for women. And it's like 326, this is incredible. And she's in the top 7%. And I'm going on. I'm saying, I'm going to, I'll tell Holly, we'll put out uh, email, we'll put out all information, you know, website, we'll put out press releases. And Ernie Dickerson says to me, when I wind down for a second, she says, Rick, you are like so stupid and short-sighted. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she goes, let me tell you what happened today. You saw 326 and you saw top 7% in the women's marathon and the Boston marathon. And that's all you see. Let me tell you what happened. There's no accommodation to Boston marathon. There are over 20,000 runners. I got to take my intellectual disabled daughter, who's largely nonverbal, has never been in a crowd like this. I got to put her in all this chaos and put her on a bus. She rides that bus halfway across town. She has to transfer it to another bus, rides that bus the remainder of the way across town, has to get off that bus, has to find her way to the, to the, um, to the um, equipment corral. She has to blow, put her sweats in the corral. Then she has to get herself to the proper place to the start line. And then she has to run the race. And she has to do that in the chaos that is 20,000 people for the Boston Marathon starting at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know if she can do this. And I am so nervous. I cannot. I'm in beside myself. And we got family members at the five-mile mark. And when they call me on the cell phone and said, we just saw her. She just crossed the five-mile marker. She looks great. She's running right along, cruising on like she always does. She said, when they called me and told me that, I knew we were home free. There's no problem because the girl can run, okay? But I didn't know if she could do it like everybody else. I didn't know if she could make those bus transfers. I didn't know if she could find that place to corral her clothes. I didn't know if she could get to the start. I didn't know if she would melt down in the chaos that is the Boston Marathon, but she didn't. And, and Ernie Dickerson says, so remember this. You saw 326 and you saw top 7%. And that's all fine because that is a great accomplishment. But don't miss the broader picture. And that is that for one day, one moment in time, my daughter is just like everybody else. Now, as stupid as I am, Paul, even <laughs> I got that. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, that's it. That's it. And see, this is the kind of stuff you, you know, you're in this thing every day like we are. And sometimes you just you, you're missing the forest for the trees. OK. And, and, and the, the, the whole thing here is inclusion, meaningful, including proving competence 
that our guys can do this like everybody else. That's why it has been so important for us. That's why I said Dave Pulaski is the greatest sports and, and, and health and fitness person in the country because we work so hard to make our, our, uh, our meets and our tournaments uh, and our golf tournaments and our swim meets. We, we, we work to make these legitimate. High school referees refereeing that basketball tournament. Virginia swim referees refereeing those swimming uh, meets. Uh, you know, professional referees when we could all get them there, and and trained volunteers when we couldn't. Because you know some sports, uh, you know, bocce, there's no referee structure for that. But we trained people to make sure they could run them because our athletes needed to do it right. And if they weren't doing it right, they were penalized or they were disqualified because that's how you learn. Mm. And our athletes learned. And they learned that they could do it right. And, you know, and when, when people come out and they see them do it right, it doesn't make any difference if it's a, if it's a 100 meter runner running 11 2, which is a high school time, which we got guys that run sub 12, okay? Or whether it's a guy running the 100 meters that runs it in 29 5, it doesn't make any difference. He's in between those lines, working as hard as he can to get to that finish line with. Uh, officials who are watching him and calling that finish of that race and making it just like everybody else. Because it's, uh, again, it's also about proving competence because if our athletes can do it on the track or they they can do it in the pool or they can do it on the golf course, they can do it in the workplace and they can do it in school. And that it's, it's healthier, fitter chance to get better and win on and off the playing field. And off the playing field, probably more important because they spend more time there. Well, uh, look, let's key in on uh, your notion of Special Olympics is not just an event or a set of events. It's, it's experiences. Um, you've traveled internationally with Special Olympics. Uh, you've seen the, the introduction of programs and events that uh, maybe didn't start until 10, 15, 20 years ago that now are powerhouses. So I'll, I'll pivot to the polar plunge. What, what was it like at the very beginning and, and what's it been like recently? The polar plunge is an incredible success story. Um, and there are a number of special Olympic programs that have polar plunges. We're the only one really that is a dest- what we call a destination plunge. It didn't start out that way. I'll, I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, 25 years ago, uh, just before the, you know, turn of the century, some women and men, uh, or especially one guy, um, called us up from a guy named Jim McDivitt, interesting character, uh, flew uh, helicopters in Vietnam, interesting character. Um, And he's part of this group called the Adventure Club in Hampton Roads. They really from both the peninsula and south side. So these guys call us up in the adventure club and they say, we're going to do a polar plunge. And I say, what's that? We're, we're going to jump into the ocean in the middle, in the middle of February or early February. And we're going to have probably about 30 people to do it. And we're going to raise money to do this on a pledge. And then we're going to give you the money. And we was like, that's great. They said, but you got to come down and see it. And you got to come down and watch it. So we go down there and I, I'm going to give kudos to Roy Zodman, who's our um, senior VP for, for, uh, development marketing because he really built this thing up and it's really it was part of his baby although it was a team effort um we got we go down there and there's 30 men and women they got a bonfire in the beach and they're sitting around it they all these sweatshirts and beach towels and stuff and all of a sudden they get up and they pull off their sweats and they run and they plunge into the ocean and then they come back and they you know <laughs> they try to get dry and then and they give us a shoe box and the shoe box got 30 grand in it this is a true story yeah, 30, they give us a they give us 30 grand in cash and checks. Okay. And we're like, well, this is great. Okay. So we 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 put in the car, we bring it back. We, you know, audit it and do all of that. And this goes on maybe for I think it was three years. They kind of did it, but each year was a little bigger. So that 10 grand uh become or that 10, 12 grand becomes 15 grand and becomes 20 grand. And then after about three years, they said, you know, this is something that we think could become popular. And you all run events and you run special events and you raise money and you've got marketing people and you got staff. We're going to give this a, this is your now your event. This is a special Olympic Virginia event. And um, here's all, the, all we ask is this. 
Every year when you do this thing and you get on that stage and you do the big check presentation, you say, we're going to do the polar plunge, give some kudos and a little bit of mention every year to the Adventure Club of Hampton Roads. Okay. These are men and women who white water kayak and climb Seneca Rock and do all this other stuff, you know, and they're a remarkable bunch of people. And so we do that every year. I mean, Jim McDivitt, we refer to him as the father of the polar plunge. He's usually down there most every year. Um, but anyway, we just began to build it, uh, build it up. And we, you know, we got had a couple of people, again, board members, community people who said to us, this is really something. And we think it could be big, but don't do it on the cheap. You know, you have to invest money to make money. You have to spend money to make money. Now you're telling me, I mean, I know about basketball and I know about other sports, but I don't know a lot about fundraising. Um, but they, so we, we went around, we, we kept that in mind and we expanded this thing out to where it became, where it is today. And it didn't get there overnight. I mean, we're like 25 years later, you know, $10,000, 25 years later for fast forward to last February 3rd or 4th or whatever it was, first Saturday in February, 2024, we raised $1.6 million on that one day. Okay. And we sold out six hotels on the ocean, ocean front. And we're right there at 31st where the Neptune statue is. The hub of the event is the big Hilton that's on the ocean front. But we there's five or six, five other hotels with it. We sell it. They they give us, they give us, they give us the max number of rooms they can while still keeping some for people who want to come down there. And we sell it every room we got. Um, and we run an incentive program so that if people raise certain amounts of money, they get a voucher for one night of the room. Um, and we sell merchandise, um, and it's just, it's a remarkable thing. I mean, the 4,000 people plunge and they raise 1.6 million. And that's just at that plunge. We do a smaller plunge, what, which we're growing in Northern Virginia at Lee Sylvania State Park in Prince William. We do another one here in Richmond at Pocahontas State Park in Chesterfield. Um, we do one in Northern Virginia at Mosaic, uh, above ground pool and a shopping mall, um, and we do one out in the New River Valley because you got a lot of big community in New River Valley between Blacksburg and the universities in Roanoke. Um, and so you put it all together, it's somewhere between one seven and one eight, but um, one six on that one at the Polar Plunge. And it's a, it's a wonderful event. Listen, it puts $10 million into the Hampton Roads economy in the two days that we're down there, okay? Because normally it would be a ghost town in February at Virginia Beach. Now you got the hotels full, which means the restaurants are working. All the local restaurants in the area are at full staff capacity. The bars are all open. Uh, maids are working. People are going to work, which means you got to eat. You put gas in your car and whatever. There's a formula that you use. It's the same formula that Steven Spielberg would use for shooting Lincoln in the city of Richmond. Um, yeah. But we use it and it's on the convention's visitors bureau uh, formula, but we put 10, we put $10 million into the economic region down there. We put $900,000 in tax revenue into the Commonwealth of Virginia. So it's a win-win. I mean, we got state senators and state delegates and mayors and all these they plunge. Okay. They go, I mean, we got one of our Senate, one of the senators that got Virginia beach, Bill D staff, a uh, former military guy, Navy guy, um, He's a state senator for Virginia Beach, but he was a former board member of ours. He plunges every year and he takes a bunch of delegates and senators down there. And because and I see him around, they go, oh, we're hiding from D. Steph because he's going to he's coming for us to get us to go to the polar plunge. But they go down, and they have a, an incredible time. And when they go for the first time, they can't believe how big the thing is. I mean, it's three blocks long. We have a tent that's probably pretty close to about 80 to 100 yards long and about 50 yards while you play football under the tent. It's got merchandise in it. It's got food services in it. It's got a stage with rock bands playing. Um, we bring the school kids out from Hampton Roads and actually school kids from anywhere because the reason we do the smaller plungers regionally is to give the school kids a chance to do it without uh, without traveling too far. Because, you know, the polar plunge is made for kids. Kids are crazy and they want to jump into water in the middle of February. But we bring the school kids from Hampton Roads out on Friday at noon, and they plunge live on uh, w, uh, key, uh, 
KTR, which is the CBS affiliate down there. And they plunge live and the CBS affiliate carries it. And they get to basically a half a day out of school. They get to go out there and they get to hang out and dance in the tent with the rock bands, run out and plunge. And they raise money. And that money, half of that money goes to Special Olympics Virginia to support programs around the state. The other half of the money they raise stays at their school to yeah. support their inclusive school programs. And we'll talk about those inclusive school programs, which includes the Little Feet meet, where I think your wife was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, um, I was there. I was there as yeah. well. Yeah. And uh, because the educational programs are very cool and they're all inclusive in all of those schools, whether they be elementary schools, whether they be middle schools or high schools, they all have an opportunity to participate in the Polar Plunge wherever they may get to it and raise money, half of which can stay at their school. Rick. So it's a school thing. Rick, in the late 90s, you, you see the the, the $30,000 event. It's 30 people. In your wildest dreams in the following weeks and months, could you ever have no. contemplated what you just no. described? We, 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 we were moving forward, and we thought, man, can we get to a million? Can we get to a million? <laughs> you know, Dr. Evil, can we get to $1 billion? Um, but can we get to a million? Uh, and when we when we got to a million, I mean, we we were just like, we thought that was just, Unbelievable. And of course, we're not particularly satisfied. So one million became one point one and a quarter and one and a quarter became one and a half and one and a half become the one and three and eventually two. So it will it will get there eventually. It, it, but yeah, it's uh, we're, very, we're very proud of the event. You know who the first group of, of, of plungers in the water is down at the polar plunge? It's mm. probably two, three hundred Special Olympic athletes who have raised money for their local programs. Because the local programs can raise money and also keep half of that money for the local program, and then the other half goes back to support programs all over. Um, but the first, you know, three or four hundred people in the water are special Olympic athletes who are plunging because they want you to know they are just like you. They're going to do it right there, shoulder to shoulder with you, and they go in the water with you. And believe me, uh, everybody in that crowd knows it, and they 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 love to see our athletes in there plunging with them. It's a very cool. Do, do you plunge? I plunge 22 straight years, my man. I plunge every year. I, I was, because, uh, because again, we have a lot of stuff going on. I wasn't always there necessarily um, in the early years. Okay. In the very first few early years. But uh, as the, as the, um, as the uh, presidency, I uh, plunged every year for 22 straight years. And I would get, it was funny. I'm a Chesterfield guy. And so, We'll talk about law enforcement people in a while, too, because law enforcement officers all over the state, police, sheriffs, Department of Corrections, military police, campus police, raise over a million dollars a year for Special Olympics, okay, in the law enforcement torch run. And a ton of, of, of uh, uh, law enforcement people plunge into polar plunge. And my sheriff in Chesterfield is a guy named Carl Leonard. He's a good friend, and he's a super guy. And his he, he plunges every year, and he has a group of probably about 15 to 20 of his deputies. And every year they're, they're different. They're, they're, they're superheroes or they're gnomes or whatever. They all, they have costumes every year they go in with and they get right beside the stage. And every year as the clock would tick down, because you have a stage with, with the, the radio disc jockeys are up there playing music, but they're the MCs. And as it gets close to the plunge time, we have a clock and it counts down. And when that thing gets to about 30 seconds, I just take off the layers of clothes that I have. I run just kind of over the fence that that survives the stage. And I get with Carl Leonard's group and I run in because I figure if I go under, the sheriff will pull me up and save me. <laughs> but um, but it's amazing. It's an amazing vent. The water is not as cold as you think. Your water temperature is usually somewhere between about 42 and 45 degrees. It's not as cold as you think. And, and, and if you get a day like it typically is in February at Virginia Beach, it's 50 and it's sunny. And, uh, you know, people come out of the water and, and, and if the weather's fair, I mean, they're just hanging on the beach and shooting selfies and whatever, you know, I mean, it's just a big hangout on the beach. And then it, 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 there's, there are everybody from people in, you know, beach attire, you know, to, I mean, you're going to see Elvis, you're going to see Bill Clinton, you're going to see Donald Trump, you're going to see the Incredible Hulk, you're going to see Superman, you're gonna see all these people in uh -huh. these costumes plunging in. And it's... um. It's just it's a it's a very cool thing. My family has plunged, um, and and my kids have done it. 
Um, there are significant others that they've they've done. It's just it's a, it's a lot of fun, and it's a it's an and it's an, it's a cool event just to go to, just to watch. But it's big. It's big. It sounds ma- sounds massive. Are, do you, you want to uh, talk about uh, school programs? We mentioned yeah, you know the, the unified champion school programs is is probably really maybe the most significant thing that we've done um, since I've been there, uh, Paul. Um, the the elementary program. Well, let me let me just stop for one reason. We we also our marketing staff is is second to none. I mean, they the first thing they did was they they own that polar plunge domain the domain. Okay, that name polar plunge is ours. You know, nobody else can use that polar plunge. You'll see polar bear plunges and you'll see other iterations of it, but the polar plunge is ours. And the Unified Champion School programs. When we started this, we thought, what are we going to do with the elementary school kids? So we, uh, these two ladies, Tina Andes and Val Reinford, Tina is retired, but Val is still there. Um, and she's the, probably the best local sports and school sports person in the country. And they created the Little Feet Meet, the Little Feet Meet, branded it. We own the, the domain name on that. And we have the, the, the rights to that name. And we sell the Little Feet merchandise, which, you know, you can sometimes go to the store if you're in a place that's pretty special, big friendly, and you can see kids or adults wearing Little Feet Meat t-shirts. And um, the Little Feet Meat, it really basically is a, like a big field day, but it's inclusive, okay? So the elementary schools come and they've got, let's say there's 15 to 20 special Olympic, special education student athletes, okay, that come from that school. And uh, there's an equal number of non-disabled teammates that come with them. So now the team has expanded out to 30 or 40 people. And when we first started this, the non-disabled teammates, they, they were really what we call, the, the original term is partners, okay? And they would, they would go and they would help the Special Olympic athletes do the events. And it's largely run, jump, throw type events. I mean, there's probably... 15 different stations in the course of the stadium and the field. Um, but it's run, jump, throw. It's a kind of a field day type of atmosphere. And after about three years, the non-disabled kids said, you know, we're not having the fun. We want to compete along as teammates with these guys. We want to race against them or race with them or throw the mini jab with them or whatever it might be. And um, so we said, okay, so we they, they're now actually teammates. And so you got a, a, an elementary school that drives up in that bus and 30 kids get off and half of them are special athletes, half of non stable teammates. They go and they do the events. And let me tell you, you were there. Did you say you went to the event in Hanover? Yeah. yeah. Cool event. Oh, it's awesome. The energy was, I, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom how much energy there was there. It was amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, un, it's unreal. I mean, people, we tell people all the time, you, the school programs are great, but you ain't lived till you've been to Little Feet Meet because I mean, you got, you have parents, uh, and I'm older than you, Paul. So you, we, we have these, these parents the age of my children or younger than my children, okay? And they got these little teeny Special Olympic athletes, severely disabled, some mildly disabled, some autistic, some with Down syndrome. It's a whole mix because um, the parents are there too, because the parents come. And sometimes, a lot of times, I mean, the school will always bring, you know, eight or 10 parents in their group as to, to help chaperone the groups because like a, basically a field trip. And um, and you just, you meet these parents and you just, you know, you you like, wow, it's, you tell, me, tell me, you know, I would take our board members out and I would, we would approach parents and I would say, this is one of our board members and I'd introduce them and I'd say, um, I just, how how is the little meat feed How's a little feet working for your child? And if you don't mind, share a little bit about what your life is like. So I'll just tell you this little story that we were at Freeman. The, the very first big little feet meet we ever had was at Freeman. Now we have a lot of big ones all over the, all over the state of Virginia. Oh, a ton of them. The biggest ones probably in Roanoke's county and city get together. And that's probably got 800 people in it. But um, we're at Freeman and um, there's a lady there. His name is Jen Thomas. And she has her son, um, Billy, and um, he's severely disabled. I mean, he is, he's in a wheelchair. He's got like spina bifida. He's intellectually disabled, nonverbal. I mean, he can't, he's, he's really, he can't do much. 
I mean, they really, they're shepherding. And he's got a teammate. They're shepherd, shepherding through the stations, you know, and work with him. And, he, and, it, you know, and I'm talking to her. And she's got two other kids that are, you know, I mean, Jimmy is probably, Jimmy's his name. Jimmy is probably eight. And the other two kids are like six and four. So she has her hands full, right? Because she had these three kids. And I'm like, so tell me about Jimmy. And she says, well, I take him to the, to the young athlete program that y'all run, which is at our church. We go there two times a week. And then he, he gets it at school. He gets the Little Feet program at school. And then I take him to the Kalugi Rehab Center in Charlottesville once a week for a rehab. And, and, and I'm saying, and he got the other two little ones too. And she says, yeah. And I said, man, how do you, how do you, get, how do you get all this done? How do you get all this done? And she looks at me and the board member, and the board member is a guy named Brian Evans. He owns American Family Fitness. You are familiar with American Family Fitness. So Evan owns American Family Fitness. And Evans is just looking at her. And she looks, he looks, she looks at us and she goes, we said, how do you get all this done? She goes, I'm manning up. Mm. And I'll never forget Evan's mouth just dropped up. And he's like, oh, my gosh. You know, and, and, and it's like their life, the, the life of the Special Olympic parent is not like mine. That's why I say they're the real heroes. But that's a true story. There's another one that we were at Little Feet Meet in Virginia Beach. We have this um, a reporter from the uh, Virginia pilot is there. He's the guy that covers the polar plunge. He covers us when things go on Special Olympics down there. And I said, uh, he says, what, what should I do at the Little Feet Meet? I've never been to one before. I said, yeah, you'll figure it out, David. I said, look, here's what I suggest you do. Wander around, watch a little bit of the event, and then approach a parent. And ask the parent about the little feet meet. And they'll, they'll, they'll give you a story. And he goes, okay. I, I don't really see him the rest of the day. The little feet meet comes and goes. I come home. And I get a, up the next morning, I got a text. And it's from the reporter. And he goes, I took your advice. I talked to a parent. The article is self-explanatory. Enough said. Read the article. It's, in, it's online in the paper. You can see it in the paper or you can see it online. He said, okay, great. I go online look. He has found a mother of one of these little feet athletes. It is not the mother of an intellectual disabled athlete. It's the mother of a non-disabled teammate. And she goes, he goes, how's this working for your child? And she goes, oh, let me tell you what. This has been in their name. Her son's name was Colin. He was the non-disabled teammate. The other kid was the athlete. His name is Ben. I don't know the last names. I really know. I didn't, I never, I don't, I didn't really meet these guys because they were just in the big group of people. The reporter was covering them. The mother says, oh, this has been the greatest thing ever for Colin. He was afraid to death of people with intellectual disabilities before he did this program. And he was really hesitant of being a non-disabled teammate. But he had earned that opportunity through his elementary school. And he was going to be paired up with this athlete, Ben. And he didn't know him. And he was really wary of him. And then after they got together and did it uh, for a few weeks, I said to him, how's it going? He goes, oh, it's great. Yeah, ben is great. He's, he said, you know what I found out mainly is Ben is not really a whole lot different than me. He just does things a little bit slower. And I can speed him up. I've sped him up and got him moving quicker. And I said, he said, I, I, I'm having, we're having a great time. It's fun. And then she tells the reporter, so the, the little, this is, this is the end. This is the little feet meet. So this is the, basically the end of the season. She says, last night, before the Little Feet meet, he comes home and he says, I'm, I'm sad that the Little Feet meet is over, but I I've, I've found a, another path. He said, I told my teacher today that when the Little Feet season is over, I now want to help Ben with math and reading. Oh, OK. Oh. And, th and th <laughs> that's the reporter's article. So the reporter's like, yeah, I got it. OK, I, I just talked to the parent. The parent told me the whole story and I get it. It's inclusion. And the the school administrators, whether it's the middle school programs, which are more, more sport oriented, specifically basketball and bocce, or the high school programs, which are basketball, bocce and track and field, um, the school administrators, the principals, the athletic directors, the teachers, they all tell us, we know we're helping the special ed students to the special Olympic athletes. And that's great. It's benefiting the non-disabled teammates more 
because they are learning about the value of a person that they've been making fun of, that they've been ridiculing, that they've been bullying, that they haven't been sitting by in class or sitting by in the cafeteria. And now they walk down the hall and they say, hi, how you doing? And they ask them how they did in the meet yesterday or come and eat with us at our table because now there's a more inclusive aspect to the school. And I mean, I, I think 99% of these schools, the data has shown, they say it's made the school better. And 97% of the kids who have returned the surveys and participated in this program said it has been a turning point. The, the non-disabled kids said it's been a turning point in their lives because they understand the value of inclusion. Yeah, my uh, I, I told you my wife uh, is in the school system and she's an instructional assistant for uh, elementary school age kids that have autism. And she's been a social worker and she was a high school special uh, ed teacher focusing on kids with uh, intellectual disabilities before autism really became a diagnosis. And every year since our oldest kid was born, they have been involved in uh, the Little Feet Meet or maybe what it was uh, known as before it was branded Little Feet Meet. And I, I, my kids are not perfect, but I will tell you they, they are better human beings because they've consistently participated in those events and, and formed um, relationships with folks non-disabled and, and certainly disabled. And I, I'm, I'm ecstatic uh, for a lot of reasons I married my wife, but one of them is for her uh, getting them involved. Well, they're just they're just very, very cool, very fun events, and they really are serving the purpose to give these kids a, a little bit of, an, of inclusion. Look, we go all over the state now and, and we'll go. We're in corporations. It could be a Geico. It could be a Booz Allen. It could be a Virginia Farm Bureau. It could be Truist. It could be VCU. It could be anywhere. We uh, I'm down the General Assembly because I'm I, 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 I stayed on for two years as the lobbyist for the group because I've been doing that. And um you run into people down at the General Assembly, but we run into these young people now. They were they work at the General Assembly. They work in corporations. They teach in schools. They're 25. They're 30. They're 35 years old, and they say, "Ah, oh, the Little Feet meet." I was in the Little Feet meet at at at, at, uh, at at Patrick Henry High School in Roanoke. I was at the Little Feet meet at Lansdowne in Virginia Beach. I was at the Little Feet meet at James River High School in Chesterfield, um, and they they all will tell you that, or they'll tell you about running track and field on the high school team with their non-disabled, with their uh, rather intellectual disabled teammates and being part of a team uh, and going on the road to meets and that kind of a thing. Um, so it's been, it's been very cool. And again, as different levels of ability there, a lot of, some of these high school kids are very athletic um, both with and without the intellectual disabilities. And some of them are not athletic at all, but they're all on the team and they're all part of it. And, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a really good thing because again, uh, Paul, it's the experience, okay? We have a tennis tournament in Charlottesville that we developed about 2010 was the first one. So we've been doing it now 14 years. And um, we have some higher skilled athletes in our program. And the problem being the higher skilled guy is that you, you really at some point have nobody to play because you're just better than everybody else in our program. And we can find them a high school guy to come and do an exhibition with them or a college person or a recreational player. Um, but that, listen, they're Special Olympic athletes. They love this program and they, they love nothing more than to be number one in their program, right? You know. So we got a guy in Charlottesville named John Freed, um, a tennis player. His mom and dad, Mark and Barbara Freed, Mark has passed on now. Um, uh, wonderful people. And when John, John was born, they told him John would never walk or talk or they probably needed to institutionalize him. And the Freeds are very strong will people. They were not going to do that. They, they worked with him and they got physical therapists and they got trainers and they got people to work with him. And over time, when he became about 25 to 30 years old, he is basically the number one Special Olympics tennis player in the world. Okay. Amazing. And, oh, yeah, it's amazing. And so, and he's really good. He, they, he plays at the Boar's Head in Charlottesville. If you were to walk into Boar's Head and see John playing, you wouldn't think he was a special Olympic athlete. You'd just think he was a club player at the Boar's Head, you know, maybe a 4 or 5 or a 5 club player. And so he, um, we decided we're going to, we're going to look and see if we got some other John Freeds out there. 
and the Freeds are going to help us put this thing together, and we're going to bring it into the Boris Hayden Charles. We're going to bring in the top 32 tennis players in the country. And we, because we thought we'd find 32 players like John, we found out very quickly it's probably only about four or five other players in the country like John. Okay. Mm. Then there are a group of players, a level below, and a group of players, a level below that, and a group of players, a level below that. But enough players to bring 32 players in from California to Texas to Massachusetts to Illinois to where all over the country. Okay. We, after a few years of having this thing, we actually brought some European players in that we had met at the World Games. We brought some uh, Swiss player, French player, Italian player in. Um, and so, so we got the 32 best players in the country, even though they're not all at the same level. So it became very quickly in our mind, we're thinking, okay, there are not 32 players like John. How many of these 32 players, how many of these 27 or 26 players who are not at that level, can we make that good? Can we make them that good? Okay, so now it becomes about improving somebody's performance. Okay, so we have the first tournament and the name of the tournament is the experience. Okay, and John is the host like the Masters and Bobby Jones as the the, the experience and John Freed. Right. And the people, the volunteers, the board said they're like, we don't get this experience thing. We don't know why we should be calling it the Boris at Invitational, the Charlottesville Championship, whatever. About in the tournament last three days, about halfway through the second day, every single one of those people would pass you by the, in the hall at the board said, and they go, yeah, we got it. We, we, we understand why this term is called the experience. We, we, we get this now. This is great. Um, and those people up there in Charlottesville, we, we now worked to get the division of the athletes as even as we could. And then we would send those athletes home with their parents or their coaches and give them things to work on. And the next year, these athletes would come back. And another four or five of them, they come in, they've lost 20 pounds. They've got musculature. They are much better at tennis. They move better. And we said to their parents, my golly, what happened? And they said, what happened was they got here and they saw the guys at the top. And they said, we can do that. We want to be that. And they said, we took them home. We found them coaches. We found them gyms to work out in three days a week. We found them tennis clubs to play in. And now they come back and they're better. And now what we're using it as is a study in performance. So we've morphed that out into other sports. Like some of the sports are actually much more easy to quantify, like a track in the field of swimming with leveling. Okay. Because, you know, tennis is, 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 is very subjective to how good somebody is. Um, but we actually have now morphed this out into a performance level program where we're looking, can we make a guy who runs the 100 meters in 14, can we make him run 12? Can we make a guy who runs 29 run 26? Because if he runs three seconds faster, which is maybe 12% increase, the only way he can do that is if he practices more and if he loses weight and if he works out. So therefore, he becomes healthier and he becomes fitter with a chance to get better and win. And now the divisioning process, which is kind of just grouping people together in groups of six, kind of, you know, based on their times. Now you get into levels of ability and your goal now is to if you're in level D is to move to level C. And your goal, if you're in C, is to become a B player. And your goal in B is to become an A player. And your goal in A is to get better. And so it becomes an opportunity for people to get more fit, to get healthier, to get better, to improve. I'm telling you, these parents, these parents swear to us, and we, we're not, we don't do any research in this area because we don't have the, the, the time and the wherewithal to do the research. But the parents swear that the fitter their child gets, the higher he is cognitively. They just say he's more, he is more cognitively aware. And, and, and so the experience is not just about sports. It's about being, can you, can you help people get better and can you help them get fitter and can you help them improve their self-confidence and all those other things 
and then get them on a program where they can then apply that into workplace because that's where you really want them to be better. You want them to be better citizens. Um, yeah. So we're working on all this stuff, Paul. This is, and people don't know we're working on this. We have health initiatives. We have a whole half million dollar health center at the University of Richmond. You know, our the average special Olympic athlete, not a middle class guy living with you know Paul Gilman in a middle in a, in a neighborhood in Hanover where he, where he goes to the dentist twice a year. Um, the average uh, special Olympic athlete is very marginalized for health care. Okay. Uh, 67% of our athletes either need glasses or they need new ones. 37% of them suffer from some preventable form of tooth decay. Mm -hmm. Um, So at the University of Richmond at Summer Games, it's not what we do, but it's what we can do when we have 1,500 athletes all in one place. We have a dental center. We partner with the Missions of Mercy and the Virginia Dental Foundation. We have 15 dental chairs set up in the Robbins Center. Every one of them is manned, manned by a local dentist. You go there and you look at it, you'll find your, maybe your dentist is volunteering because I, I, I found my kid's dentist, my kid's dentist there with the, fir- the first year we had them. Um, we have an optometry center where they'll grind glasses for you on the spot. We have an audiology center where you can get fit for a hearing aid. We have a fitness center where they'll assess your fitness and give you things to work on to make you more fit. Um, we're doing things with healthy, with mindfulness and healthy minds just trying to get people to understand, you know, calming uh, uh, techniques. So because our athletes suffer from a lot of maladies, man. Our guys get marginalized, uh, not only intellectually disabled, but they can just get marginalized in the gene pool. So they have a lot of problems um, and a lot of various conditions that we're trying to help them with. Um, and it's, it's a very cool thing. That, I mean, the, it floors people. We're the only group in the country that you can come to summer games. And if you don't see a dentist, you can see one. And if you need to get a cavity filled, they'll fill it right there. You know, people say to me, summer games is about sport and inclusion and joy and happiness and fun. And you are drilling on people's teeth. And we went, yeah, man, but I tell you what, on Saturday night at the celebration, when a girl comes up to you and says, first time in 10 years that my mouth is not hurt. That's a significant life improvement, Paul. So we do health initiatives. We do the school programs. We do the traditional program. We augment that with including the law enforcement community and fundraising. And a ton of athletes run in the torch runs with the law enforcement people and participate with them in fundraising. Um, We've had law enforcement agencies who have begun special cadet courses uh, full of people with intellectual disabilities. Stafford County, David Decatur, it was started by Charlie Jett before him, special star force, sworn in by the local judge. And these guys, they have uniforms just like the sheriff's deputies do. And they have a whole program of law enforcement awareness. Um, the Polar Plunge. Um, we have an, a, a, an event at Dulles uh, that is the plane pull where a team of 25 people at a corporation can raise $5,000 and pull a 747 Airbus have to pull it 12 feet on the tarmac. 25 people can pull an Airbus ball. It's not that hard. 25 Special Olympic athletes are the first team that pull. Um, We raise about a half million dollar Dulles Airport, only public airport in the country that gives 13,000 people public access to come and watch a plane pull. Um, And kudos to Dulles Airport. They're just a great partner of ours. Um, And uh, so we do a lot of, lot of unique things to not only raise money and create awareness, but to include the public and provide an experience for people so that they will understand that the things that really make us different, really make us all more the same. You mentioned world games. Uh, This is kind of a a double question here. One, I'd just love to get your uh, perspective on what the world games is all about at, at a high level, but also if you're an athlete, how do you make it to the World Games? What do you have to accomplish to get to the World Games? Well, you know, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a tricky process because it's ability levels, okay? And our our program is full of different levels of ability. You compete against people at your level of ability. So if we were just going to go and handpick people to go to the World Games, Paul, we'd you know hire stronger, faster, right? We just pick the strongest ones. But that's not how it works. the The meets are set up, as we said on divisions of your own performance, trying to get performance levels and then trying to improve performance. But you got to have a level that people fit into. And you have to run within your division, within your level. And you have to win your race 
or you have to win, win your flight in the golf tournament, or you have to win your division in the basketball tournament, your team. And then if we've got, uh, after the summer games track and field meet, which is the qualifier for world games, if we've got 60 people who have qualified as winners over the multiple events that they're in, um, then they all go into one pool and we will randomly select. Now, if we've got if we've got four track and field athletes to go to world games, we will separate out the A levels, B levels, C levels, D levels, or division ones, twos, threes, and fours, because, and we'll pick a randomly a champion from each of those levels, because that will assure us that it might not make for an equitable relay team, but what it will ensure us is that every level of our program has the opportunity to get this experience. OK, of going to the World Games. I mean, you know, it used to be that you were going to Minneapolis or you were going to um, Raleigh, Durham or the Triangle in North Carolina uh, or you were going to Notre Dame or you, it, all cool, all cool events. But in 2003, they go outside the country. So now we're taking teams to Dublin in 2003, Shanghai in 2007, Athens, Greece, home of the Olympics in 2011. Los Angeles back in the U.S. for the first time since 1999 and 2015. Abu Dhabi in the UAE in 2019. Uh, and last summer we had a crew that went to Germany, to Berlin. Um, pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. Oh, and man. and so, so after we select that team, because, you know, people say, well, your random selection, you know, you got, you got the best guy doesn't always go. Best is a relative term in Special Olympics, Paul. OK, we want our athletes to know that to be the best is one thing, but to be your best is everything, because that will put you into the hunt to advance. OK, and so, yes, we have taken people like Karen Dickerson around the best at Boston Marathon because she came out the draw. OK, we've taken John Freed because he came out the draw. But we have also taken lower, lower level athletes who run the 100 meters in 25 seconds because they came out the lower end of the draw. We want to take a team that is representative of our program. And we don't want for one minute to think that our, we don't want for one minute for our lower skilled athletes to think they're not as important as the higher skilled ones. It, 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 our Special Olympic athletes would tell you that Special Olympics is a bubble. It's an equity bubble, okay? You inside the Special Olympics community and family, you are all equal. It doesn't make a difference how fast you run or how high you jump. They are all rooting for each other, okay? And they all want to get that thing and go to the World Games. But they also understand they got to win in their level of division. And then they got to be a little bit lucky to come out of the draw because the random draw really protects the lower level. I, I, so it's, I'm, an, it's, an equitable, it's an equitable thing. And it, it might not make a lot of sense to you, Paul, because I'm explaining it to you like no, that. But if you no, were around sense. and saw it over, over time, it's, it's, a, it's an equity piece. No, it, it made uh, total sense to me. Uh, it warms my heart that you said Shanghai and UAE. Uh, what percentage of countries roughly have viable uh, programs and experiences for those? Uh, it's about 150 now. It's a somewhere, give or take. I don't know the exact number because every year it becomes a few more. OK, but I mean, they're 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 from everywhere and they're they're a little 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 South American, Latin American, African countries. And, you know, U.S. and Russia and China and, you know, Australia. We have a, we have a, we have another a girl in our woman, girl, woman in our program, Grace Ann Braxton, uh, arguably for 20 years, the number one female golfer in Special Olympics. She lives in Fredericksburg. Um, and the great story about Grace Ann is that Grace Ann started lower level in the individual skills competition, which is the equivalent of the drive, chip, and putt that you might see connected to Augusta National. Um, and then after she did the individual skills, Grace Ann did nine-hole play with an with a alternate shot with a partner. Then she played nine-hole individual, then 18 holes with a partner, then 18 individual. Grace Ann continued to improve, became a number one player in Special Olympics in the world. She is presently a seven handicap maybe eight wow. handicap player out of Fredericksburg uh, in, in October of 2022, uh, coming up on just a little, little about a year and a half ago. Uh, Grace Ann Braxton 
was inducted into the Virginia Golf Hall of Fame. And Lanny Watkins did the induction and it was at Independence and it was stunning to see her go into the Golf Hall of Fame. And she is a great player. She has she plays in the USGA National now that actually is broadcast on the Golf Channel for the last three years at Pinehurst. Um, she's been down there and they divide them. They take all disabilities at Pinehurst, not just intellectual, but they have them categorized missing limbs, um, intellectual disabled. They, they have all, um, uh, they, they have a category for, for physically small statue people. They have uh, all kinds of categories for all kinds of disabilities. Grace Ann has been a number one person in the intellectual disabled category every year in the tournament. Uh, and is, I think she finished fourth overall in the women's category last year. Um, but they go, they played at Pinehurst. You know who else played at Pinehurst in about two weeks, three weeks is the U.S. Open. So, I mean, Pinehurst is like the big time. And yeah. so the USGA takes those athletes down to Pinehurst and Grace Ann does that. And, and I have never seen one person. Grace Ann is one of those people that she'd go to the world games year after year after year, and she'd win by 20 shots. And last year in Germany, a girl showed up from Australia and beat her. Wow. And I have never seen somebody more happy to be beaten than Grace Ann because what it meant is her influence has extended out and the world has gotten smaller. And now she's got competition. And she just thought the Australian girl was a great champion. Now, not sad that she didn't win it, a little disappointed, but she knows that her legacy has been to fight, to leave this program and make sure that that she had been able to get the word out to get more people that are as good as her. And it's finally come on. There's a girl from Canada that she, um, that they, that they actually allow to come in and play in the, the uh, USGA thing at Pinehurst and they battle it out. And that the girl from Canada finished third uh, in Germany. So that, you know, you, now you got, now you got people who are getting up there and improving their performance because of the inspiration that Grace Ann has been in the golf circles. And if you took Grace Ann into pretty much any country club in a, in the state of Virginia, the pros there would know who she was. We we had a board member named Matt McDavid that works for EY, and Matt's a member at Hermitage Country Club. So we're going to take Grace Ann and the other golfer. We had David Sutton, who's a good player, but not a Grace Ann's caliber, but he's a good player. Um, we're going to take him out to, to Hermitage Country Club for a practice round about a couple of months before they go into the World Games. And um, we walk into the clubhouse at Hermitage, and the pros are standing behind the desk and they look and they come around the you know, around the counter and they're hugging Grace Ann. They go, Grace Ann, Grace Ann, how you doing? It's good to see you. And Matt McDavid, our board member, is floored because he he doesn't realize how well known she is in the golf circles in Virginia. And to, to have athletes who are ambassadors like that um, in our program, whether it be Karen in the marathon or Grace Ann there or John Fried in tennis, um, or whether it be some of our lower level athletes who we take out in our public relations program who greet people at Publix when Publix raises money during the month of January for Special Olympics. You know, we, our athletes love to get involved in every aspect of our program, help move it forward because it's their program, it ain't my program. And this is what I told people at the Hall of Fame. I didn't make a goal. I didn't sink a putt. I didn't make a three point shot. I didn't do any of that. You know, I've connected some dots, Paul, as we said at the beginning of the podcast. But, um, Special Olympics is really about those athletes and about their family members and about the great volunteers that we have in the state of Virginia, whether they're in the local programs or whether they're in the state events or whether they're in law enforcement or the corporate world. And it's about the number one staff in the country. And it's about a board who comes in every day and says, how can I help you? And if you put that formula together and you do what good coaches do, because all I really wanted to be was a coach and you build a bench then I told people for years, all, they, they would say, what do, you, what do you want to happen when you retire? I said, I want no one to notice because the, yeah. special, the, because the Special Olympic of Virginia tr train just keeps chugging merrily down the track. Um, and so I left. David Thomason became the successor. And, you know, I texted David at the Polar Plunge when they raised 1.6 down now in February, which was a record. And I said, congratulations on the Polar Plunge. I want you to know. It's great not to be needed. Yeah. Hey, last couple of things, uh, Rick. You, you've told some incredible stories tonight. I, I imagine there are countless other incredible stories where people nice getting are, started, Paul. 
<laughs> I'm going to go see my son who's only in, in my house for 18 I hours. Know, I know. But, uh, I imagine you have cried tears of joy a number of times. I mean, what a fulfilling way to live your life, Rick. And, and it's not just you, right? I mean, you've certainly had a lot of great experiences over a long period of time, but everybody in those programs get to experience these amazing uh, stories every time they, they interact in these experiences. Yeah, I listen, this is like I said, I, I tell young people all the time, be awake, be awake, okay? And I tell young people, find something that you really like to do because you won't really have to work, okay? Yeah. Because I, I I tell people and I'll tell you that I'll tell your 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 viewers this or your listeners. I woke up every morning, Paul, for 36 years in mortal fear. I would have to get a real job one day. <laughs> now, I didn't want to do that. You know, I was having too much fun doing this. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I just it, it is. It's a, it's a gas. It's it's a it's it, it is great to go to work every day and have it be something different and something new, a new challenge, a new story, a new accomplishment. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, it is great. Cause if you do that stuff, you, you don't have to work a day in your life. It just all happens. And again, I connected a lot of dots. And so I, I will take credit for doing that. All right. Last thing. I imagine uh, it's pretty obvious, maybe a bit self-explanatory how folks can help. Uh, and I imagine there are hundreds of ways people can engage, but what are, what are the top two or three ways? Uh, yeah, well, I think the number one is being a volunteer. Uh, you can go on our website. It's very user friendly. Uh, <clears throat> and it's funny for me to tell you that because I'm like the, the least technologically uh, you know, adept individual in the world. It's very user friendly. You can click on there and find volunteer and you can find a way to volunteer. You can volunteer in a state games, which maybe happens once or twice a year. You can volunteer in a local program. You could coach an athlete for a season. Um, you could help the local program run their program. You can go, you can, when time for the polar plunge comes around, you can get six of your friends. You can get together. You can tell people you're going to raise money for Special Olympics. You can raise money. You can go to Virginia Beach, jump in the ocean and, and have a good time, eat some good food um, and, and, and have a, a good time because Basically, outside of the polar plunge, it's a big community party down there at the Special Olympics. It's nice at the at the polar plunge. Um, you can uh, you can you can you can volunteer at the school in the school programs. If you're a kid, you can go to your school and say, "How come we don't have a Special Olympic Unified Champion School program here? How come we don't have a Little Feet program here?" If you're an elementary school kid, go to Little Feet. Uh, listen. My wife was a reading specialist in Chesterfield County. So every year I would get called up by various people around the county come and read on Dr. Seuss Day. OK, and I would always read the Sneetches, you know, because the Sneetches, the star belly Sneetches and the plain belly Sneetches. And it's about individual differences. OK. Right. And the first thing I would do when I would get in the, the, the classroom, whether it be third grade or fifth grade or second grade or whatever, I was I would say. How many of you people have ever, how many of you people know what the Little Feet meat is? And I mean, you would not believe virtually everybody's hand goes up. They all know what the Little Feet meat is and they right. all can explain it to you. And it's, and it's, it's a very cool thing. So there's a lot of things that you can do, but you have to decide what you want to do. If you want to do, if you want to do a lot, we will special Olympics you to death. Okay. If you, if you want to do, have an experience once a year at a state event, where you see really athletes come in from all over the state and a state level tournament and a lot of excitement. And you don't have to volunteer in the sports. You could volunteer on the ceremonies. You could volunteer on the food services. You could volunteer on the medical center because besides having the docs and the medical personnel in there, we need a ton of volunteers just to take, just to get our athletes registered in, into the medical, into the, into the health center. There's a ton of stuff you can do, but the website really explains it all, you know, and you, you, then you have to be awake. It's like one of the one of the volunteers at the experience in Charlottesville, the tennis tournament. It's a woman named Laura, Laurie Greer <clears throat> and Laurie and her husband own a brewery, uh, 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 one of these many, you know, it's a local brewery in Crozet called Pro Renata. OK, sits right on Crozet Road as you get off the Crozet exit. And Lori volunteers registration at the experience every year. So she's not really involved with it 
with the with the actual play. She's involved in registering to players and making sure they have what they need and that kind of stuff. And so I spoke at the opening ceremony and I say the same thing I say it every time that I speak at these ceremonies. And I said it at the breakfast that you were at. I said, because we had two or three special Olympic athletes there that I introduced. Yep. I said, don't leave this morning before you go over and just speak to these guys, because you can have a little mini experience here. And so I said that, at the, I said, don't leave the experience before you go over and meet some of our special Olympic athletes and see how special they are. About six months later, I go, I'm up at Charlottesville at a meeting and I run into Lori Greer and she goes, oh, listen, we hired Shannon Flanagan to work at Pro Renata. I'm like, you hired Shannon? She said, yeah. I said, tell me why. She said, because you told me to. Okay. Now, now I just mentioned that at the speech, but she got to know Shannon. Shannon Flanagan does not play tennis in that tennis tournament. She just comes in as a local special Olympic athlete to volunteer and help at the tournament. And she was helping Lori and Lori got to know her, talked to her husband. They hired her at, at Pro Renata. She'd been working there about five years. And every year they do a gold medal beer release in her honor. Wow. <laughs> Pretty cool. That's the kind of stuff, Paul, that you can't, you can't, you can't even dream about that stuff. Okay. Because I connected a dot for Lori Greer to Shannon Flanagan, but she made it happen. Okay. And Shannon, Shannon really made it happen. Yeah, no, that's great. Rick, I appreciate you joining me, man. I, you and I just met three weeks ago. I asked you to do this and you're, you're like, absolutely. Uh, and, and it's really good to see uh, somebody love what they do and have such an impact uh, on the world around them. So uh, thank you for, for a, a life well lived so far. And I know you're doing more um, in, in semi-retirement, we'll call it. Well, thank you, Paul. It's great. Uh, good luck with your podcast as you move forward. And I just would tell everybody the same thing I said at the end of my induction speech. When you go out there in your neighborhood or your community or your school or your workplace, include more and more and exclude less and less. That's the best advice I can give you. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. I'm going to go see my kid, Rick. Thanks for doing this. And Tell uh, him I said bon voyage. <laughs> we'll, we'll do. And uh, yeah, man, we, we need more people like you in the world, Rick. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. But uh, Paul, I appreciate it. And I uh, thank you for the opportunity to help get the message out. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.